<laughs> Hello, I am so honored to be here today. My name is Dr. Sarah Myrie. I am a climate and ocean scientist. And just to begin, I want to thank Congreso Futuro and the people of Chile and uh, the scientific institutions of Chile for the honor to be here today. I specifically want to thank the women scientists that I have met in the last couple of days, and also the women scientists who shut down the universities in, the, 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 uh, um, in June and July here in Chile because of sexual harassment. I salute you and I fight with you. Yes. Okay, <laughs> I'm here to talk about science and feminism and climate change and leadership. I'm from a city called Seattle, Washington in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. I am um, from a land of um, mountains and um, rivers and salmon and orca whales and black bears. I'm from a country similar to and different from Chile. I'm from a country characterized by the genocide of indigenous people. I'm from a country that ne never reconciled the history of slavery and genocide. I'm from a country that has turned away from restorative justice. I'm from a country that is fundamentally unequal. I am from a country where the man in power is a fascist, mediocre, and violent man who brags publicly about sexually assaulting women. I am from a country that is the number two emitter of carbon emissions in the world. I am from a country that may soon strip the rights to abortion from its citizens. So there's some similarities and some differences between the United States and Chile. I'm also from a country that has invested billions of dollars into the scientific infrastructure to shine a very, very bright light of the scientific frontier across the world. I'm from a country that invests in the careers of individual scientists. I am one of those scientists. For the last 10 years, I have been studying Earth's past which is a beautiful way to spend your time if you get to do it. It's a luxury and a privilege to pursue academic research. The last million years on our planet has been characterized by oscillations between cold glacial states and warm interglacial states. The planet, like a heartbeat, has been paced through these changes, cold to warm, cold to warm, and these changes, these beautiful, this music of the planet was fundamentally driven by the changing relationship between the Earth and the Sun. The celestial geometry and the wiggles and wobbles of Earth's orbit and rotation drove massive changes across our biosphere. It's, a, it's an amazing thing to be on a planet, a living planet that has incredible, beautiful history that we can study and understand. And as a scientist, it's a privilege to do so. The last 10,000 years, we have been in the relative warmth of an interglacial, very different from the ice-bound states of the glacial eras, which only 20,000 years ago we were in the midst of. Now we are exiting the Holocene, the interval of relative stability, and we're moving into the Anthropocene. We're moving into a dangerous and unknown time, a time of catastrophic fires and warming, um, incredibly damaging and dangerous storms. We're moving into a time when um, oceans are acidified and we lose vast biomes of life. It has been my role as a scientist to understand these systems and to pay attention. And yet, once we do the work of researching and understanding and publishing, 
what good is our work in the world to do? What good does it do for me to just elevate my own career by publishing science and walking away from the kind of changes that we are looking at as a human society? This is why Congreso Futuro is so special. We're here to connect and talk and communicate about science, to close the gap between science and society, and to reflect upon what kind of species we actually are and who we want to be. I would suggest to you that communication of science, even though it's fun, it's fun to tell a story, it's fun to be um, immersed in the imagination, it's fun to see the amazing capacity that we as humans have to innovate and to have new ideas, that communication is insufficient to meet the needs of this new world. Because millions to billions of people's lives are on the line. Death, disease, poverty, water insecurity, the loss of vast biomes of life, the loss of the systems that sustain us. All of these things are on the line. We need scientific leadership that is brave enough and bold enough to look at these problems and see themselves not as arbiters on the sideline documenting the decline of the planet, but as fundamental leaders in this space to help protect and steward human life. It is the fundamental reason why we invest in science, right? It is the fundamental reason why we're here. You hear a lot about climate change solutions and you hear eat less meat, um, don't drive your car, reduce flying, and all of these are well and good, but they don't actually reflect the power structures that are embedded in the inequity of the society that has produced this from the very beginning. Because the reason why this fight is so hard is that we, as a, as a global society, are fighting the entrenched economic interests of the most powerful and wealthiest economic entities that have ever existed on the face of this planet. This is why this fight is so hard. We are fighting the most violent oligarchs on the planet. Every day I stand up in public and try as a scientist and as, as a citizen to do what I can individually, but I am not as powerful as the most powerful and violent men on this planet. This is why leadership is so critical. And we need to move collectively into a space where we recognize that if we do not care for other people, we are lost. If we cannot care for the suffering of other people, what good is the work that we have to do in the world? The ethic of care, of caring for the suffering of other people, is rooted in a feminist ethic of care, an idea about the world that says, it's not about what the right thing to do or a reductive um, solution to a problem, that we together are embedded in a network. Together, we steward the connections to other people. We, of course, see this fundamental ethical and moral lens in the relationship between parent and child. It's one of the things that defines us as a human, as a human species. This feminist ethic of care is an incredibly important lens to look at climate information. It's, a, it's something that we can see through. Often feminism, you know, you, you hear about feminists, right? And we're angry or we're hysterical or we're ridiculous. Or feminism is thought to be a vehicle to elevate women to succeed and perform as men. But this is fundamentally misinformed. This is not what feminism is all about. Feminism is a lens to look and see the violence violation and degradation and suffering that has been in front of us all along. It is a way to extend decency and empathy and rights to people around us, regardless of race, origin, gender, sexuality, or language. Feminism is a fundamentally useful tool to think about the way that power and justice is distributed in society how to extend moral weight and value to people who have been systematically eroded and degra degraded and erased. And I'll show you an example, I'll tell you an example of why this is so important in the climate spaces. 
When Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, a climate-amplified tropical storm, 3,000 U.S. citizens died. These people, they didn't die because of the storm. They died because the racist and negligent leadership of the Trump administration refused to extend moral weight and value to the people of Puerto Rico, the U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico, because of the color of their skin and the language they spoke. The people of Puerto Rico were left to die on their own, and it is a disgrace that the United States will carry with, with itself into the future. In this action of extending moral weight and value to other people, I want to invite you into thinking about solutions for climate change from a feminist lens, focused on human rights. We now know that one of the most primary solutions for reducing carbon emissions and greenhouse gases by 2050 to get us to carbon neutrality as a global society in order to maintain society and the planet within a safe and cool envelope, the primary solution that we should focus on for human rights is together the, the equity of education for girls and women globally and the access to comprehensive reprodu reproductive rights for women and girls. And this includes free and open access to abortion fundamentally. Why? Because when women have control over their lives and their bodies, they make fundamentally different decisions. Often, but not always, they have fewer children later in life. Often, but not always, they make decisions to rise their families out of poverty. Often, but not always, the decisions that they make have structural changes for the entire society around them. If women were free to have education and to choose their own reproductive destiny, we could see a reduction of one billion people on the planet by 2050 and changing the uh, landscape of poverty across the planet because of the co-benefits when women are free. I challenge every leader here, every scientist here, to lead with a feminist ethic of care. Extend moral weight and value to the bodies and lives of women. Now is the time to do it. Extending moral weight and value to women is on par with any other technological solution that you might hear about discussed regarding climate change. Often in society, we are told that a strong man will fix our problems. That's one of the reasons why in my country, Donald Trump was elected. A strong man with all the answers will fix our problems if we just invest in the right technology. But I would, I would question that because who benefits in that framework of making decisions? Often it, is continued to, it continues to benefit the richest and most powerful men in the world. As a scientist, I will tell you that it is not strong men that will solve the crisis of climate change. It will be free women. Thank you so much for your time and attention today. I love you. I send all my care.